concept of parity, which is uh, funny. If you actually go on deadcoins.com, you can go uh, project by project and drill down and see some of the due diligence and research that was done. So if you're looking for some entertainment, I recommend the parity, <laughs> parity section of that website. What are we talking about cryptos and ICOs? What, what is this? Uh, from the lens of uh, uh, the cryptocurrency community, um, there may be dispute. But from the standpoint of regulators, and I'll use the U.S. as an illustration of this because the U.S. has fragmentation from a regulatory standpoint, and that fragmentation has actually been represented in how the regulators have looked at the phenomenon of cryptocurrencies and ICOs and what it is that they've labeled, how they've dealt with them, the direction they seem to be taking. So FinCEN, uh, which uh, operates within the Treasury circumstance, identified the early Bitcoin uh, activities as money transmission. And uh, in some cases brought suit because folks weren't certifying under the uh, regulatory provisions around money transmission. So that's one camp. In another camp, we have what's known as the Commodity Futures Trading Commission in the US, the CFTC, which is labeling cryptocurrencies and crypto assets as commodities. In fact, uh, uh, there's a lot of work that's been done in that area and a lot of opportunity that's being pursued in the crypto community, traditional community, to bring to life a commodity-like instruments associated with it. In Wyoming, the state of Wyoming, uniquely, is considered property. Wyoming and Utah have been in competition with the state of Delaware for years. Delaware is that place where you incorporate corporations, traditional uh, <coughs> corporations, but as well limited liability corporations. Whether it's for banking law purposes or other purposes, both Wyoming and Utah have put in legislation intent on attracting banking institutions, financial institutions to their jurisdictions. So over this last summer, Wyoming put a series of uh, legislation through the legislature that both encourages startups to locate favorable tax circumstances, favorable treatment from a legal standpoint, but they have gone on to label what we'll call crypto assets as property. There's clearly tax implications and other implications around the distinction between that commodity, money transmission, and currency. I deliberately left security last our ICO securities, the how we test to uh, those who are familiar with it, is applied to this, I'll not go into the details of that. I'll offer that September 11th was a very significant day once again this year, not only for being the 17th anniversary of the attacks, but on September 11th, the SEC took action in three cases, brought suit, civil action against a broker dealer, considered to be dealing fraudulently with cryptocurrencies, an exchange against civil action dealing with cryptocurrencies. There are individuals identified in these cases. And criminal action in the state of New York against an entity that was acting as an issuer. Broker dealer, exchange, issuer. All in one day, out of the New York District Court, 11th of September. Not saying, I'm just saying. <laughs> They're making a statement, right? So uh, certainly attorneys who pay attention, certainly those that advise uh, folks who are considering ICOs, there's a lot of work to be done. I recently saw a metric that suggested if you're going to try to raise $10 million in an ICO, you can count on spending about $2 million on legal and marketing expenses alone. Right? And even then, you may not be buttoned down. The larger picture here is that there is, and this is not new to cryptocurrencies, there is jurisdictional arbitrage going on, folks, jurisdictional tourism going on, where folks are looking to find locations like Zug, like Malta, like Singapore, where they can locate their ICO and feel they are protected uh, from uh, regulators that are aggressive. That said, they still have a challenge, at least as regards to the United States, in demonstrating that investors from the United States have not uh, participated in, in their instrument. So this is an area, if you are uh, curious at all, I encourage you as, you as you look across 
uh, to ask yourself the question, what kind of instrument are we actually talking about here? Um, and what are, the, what are the regulators? Notably in the United States, so now we have fragmented regulation across these sectors in finance, and then we have states and, and differences between federal delegated powers and the general jurisdiction of states. States have a lot of opportunity uh, to spread their wings, if, if you will, and I think Wyoming's work in that case is, is illustrative of that, as was in marijuana law, uh, Colorado, Washington, California. Some indication that in the United States, if you find the right state, you're in a pretty good situation. Crypto assets more generally, in addition to cryptocurrencies, we now have the emergence of stable coins pegged in some fashion to the dollar or gold, providing that stability. Uh, ICOs and now this another iteration, security tokens, digital assets more generally. Derivatives instruments, that fits in that commodity category. There are hedge funds, fund of funds, hybrid VC funds. What do I mean by hybrid? Hybrid in the sense that the VC fund is investing in distributed ledger and or cryptocurrency ventures that may be ICOs, may be straight up ventures uh, that are building on the technology and active, or hybrid in the sense that their source of funds is coming uh, alternately uh, from those two worlds. Uh, fascinating to look at that. And then uh, somewhat classically, and this depends on jurisdiction where you can uh, put these packages together, master trusts, special purpose vehicles, and then, then offshore vehicles. They're all present, some less visible than others, but uh, as one might expect, um, just settling on the currency of the security isn't enough. There's some packaging going on. Um, and uh, an effort to, get, to gain returns uh, using different models around management of a portfolio of investments, if you will. I pause and say, uh, with all due respect to all the tech people, it's time to get past this. It's time to get past this. What do I mean by this? The next few slides I'm going to share with you what is coming the other way, the wave coming the other way from Wall Street and traditional banking. A focus on the user, the user experience, and what the investor is seeking in the investment side, whether it's a retail investor, uh, retail deposit customer, or an institutional investor. And the user interface and the experience that those folks are going to have can't be command line code. Can't. You're not going to broaden the community if you stay in this place. This is really important. The underlying technology is very important. There's tremendous work being done, both in the startup community, through enter en enterprises like the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance consensus more broadly, as well as the Hyperledger uh, Linux Foundation projects, but it is time to get past this if we want the appeal to be uh, more significant. And in fact, Wall Street is coming. Five years ago, I spent time with the CEO of OmniX, which is in, out in Silicon Valley, raised $10 million just by putting their hands up and saying, we're going into business. Who's the CEO? He was the former head of innovation strategy and blockchain at State Street the largest, if not one of the largest custodians, global custodians. The man knows his business. What has he done? He's brought together a dream team to create institutional crypto trading platform. You can see that there. Whether it's order management, portfolio management, supporting algorithmic trading, smart order, routing, fixed API enabled, the back end operations, risk and compliance, targeting institutional investors, market makers, and broker dealers. They're bringing that expertise, that knowledge, those connections, and that level of funding to the crypto community to package it up and make it usable, to get beyond command line code and allow folks to, to run portfolios and, and do their business. Interestingly, on the advisory board is the former chairman of the American Stock Exchange, Art Levin, who's very well respected very well respected in the United States, quite willing to call out Wall Street during the financial crisis in the banking community. Also on that board, the former chairman of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, Sheila Baer. Sheila was very visible during the financial crisis because she had her hands filled as dozens and dozens of banks were failing all over the United States, testifying on Capitol Hill 
keeping her arms around the bureaucracy as two administrations came and went. Sheila Bears on that board. Also a former senior executive of Visa. Very serious entry into the markets. Down in the, in the that more in the back office and middle office, a firm, uh, a young man that I got to know about four years ago named Jake Benson had the insight that folks that were trading Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies might have a tax accounting issue. So he developed the UI to support that. Uh, Jake came into our shop about three and a half years ago, met with our executive team. He managed to attract the uh, head of blockchain technology from PwC to become his chief commercial officer. They had more business than they know what to do with. Hundreds of institutions from around the globe, $25 million in, in VC funding from strong investors, including corporate investors. And what are they offering? Uh, they're going to be aggregating data and information across currencies as well as with traditional assets to give you that financial and operational data that you would want. They have a concept of crypto, re crypto asset reference data that they're working. The tax accounting is still a piece as performance accounting. And they are working on, and as they should, I think a strong insight, some means by which to continuously monitor the distributed ledger, whatever the client happens to be on, to provide information for information systems auditors. Because clearly that's part of the picture. Can I rely on the network? What is the behavior of the network? And underneath the covers, what's going on here around the validation of the transactions, the consensus mechanisms, and the like. So Libra Tech. Another plug for Scott Chain, Jeremy Drain, the chief commercial officer for Libra Tech, is going to be coming to Scott Chain. He'll speak on a panel about enterprise challenges uh, in implementing distributed ledger technology. And then he will spend some time uh, after that panel talking about just this, operationalizing the crypto asset ecosystem and what they're doing. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, they're, a, they're quite a, an interesting company. But that's all institutional. Why should you really be concerned? Who recognizes this? Back. I can say it right, yes. Backed. Just announced in early August, proposes to buy, sell, store, provide custody for digital assets, including one day physical delivery of Bitcoin. I'm not sure what that means quite yet. <laughs> really not sure. I've got my phone somewhere here. Um, that's standing in front of the CFTC right now, actually, approval on that. This is fascinating because backed actually is ICE. ICE is the uh, holding company entity uh, that gets started in futures, bond trading, and the like. Owns the New York Stock Exchange, owns the London Stock Exchange, gets 50% of its revenues from pricing and analytics, another 20% from exchange data, and another 20% from networking. Do you think they know technology? Do you think they perhaps thought they had an existential risk around where trading was going to go? It's interesting, Jeff Scheffler, who is the, uh, the uh, specter, it's pronounced his name properly, said two years ago he wasn't convinced that there was a place in financial services and industry for blockchain technology. And here's the announcement. And I'm going to read to you what it is that the CEO of BACT uh, said and was quoted around the efficiency, the transparency, the liquidity, the price discovery that they're going to be able to offer. In bringing regulated connected infrastructure together with institutional and consumer applications, we aim to build confidence in the asset class mm -hmm. on a global scale, consistent with our track record of bringing transparency and trust to previously unregulated markets. Hmm. Trust, confidence, transparency, regulation, global scale. They're serious. They're deadly serious, and they have spent quite a bit of time. Interestingly, they brought with them some partners. Boston Consulting Group, you can't do big things and do big things without Boston Consulting Group and Deloitte. Uh, <laughs> I see. I tried. Microsoft, Microsoft Azure, but um, 
Microsoft Azure's a, a blockchain program that sits within Microsoft Azure. I know the guys that ran that two years ago. That guy, Hugh, who runs uh, OmniX, myself, and about a dozen others from the major banks were in a room at Microsoft's uh, headquarters hearing from the CEO of Azure about their blockchain roadmap. Block, uh, Microsoft has been very serious about working with uh, traditional financial institutions and bringing blockchain to bear. So I guess I'm not surprised they're here. The surprise and the fascinating thing is Starbucks, because they want to appeal to the retail investor, and, and who else more do we trust and are willing to rely on a consistent service but tailored just the way we want it and have a mobile experience than Starbucks. And now we can go anywhere and have that consistent experience that we trust uh, from Starbucks, right? Very clever move on their part. But they're more clever by half. If you go on their website, there's artwork. In fact, you can customize your, your page for this. This is my customization. Now, I'm not sure what this is. It looks a little bit like feathers and ribbons, the sort of a breeze coming to the northwest or something like that. What's going on here? Well, here's the explanation about the art on the website. It's supposed to symbolize our individual experience that we all bring. It's by a Finnish artist who lives in Brooklyn. And he's rendering these organic patterns with natural science effects and movement, handcrafted in analog textures in a digital space. This is not your father's New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> this is explicitly focused on trying to attract those folks, dare I call this the hipster version of, yeah, it's the New York Stock Exchange, but isn't it cool? It appeals to me as an individual. So the New York Stock Exchange, I think, very, uh, very closely is channeling this, uh, this deeper uh, experience around the individual and control here, but going to be a bastion of trust, drawing on its capital, drawing on its technology expertise to do what it has declared it wants to do. So I encourage you to pay very close attention to what's going on with BACT. Crypto services back up now. So some of these I've already covered, but this is actually on the service side. So we looked at the assets. What services now have started to emerge, whether within the startup community or coming from traditional financial services to enable crypto assets in their management. Payments, AML, KYC, trade finance, uh, transfer agency, custody, asset servicing kind of across the board, including fund accounting and fund admin, pricing, algo trading and order routing, dark pools, exchanges, reference data, portfolio management and analytics. That's a pretty robust uh, set of services now that have emerged just in the last five years. Traditional financial services, very serious. Entrepreneurs who may have found themselves in the financial community may be a little frustrated with the pace their organizations are going, but say, heck, I can apply this learning and help put this structure in place. And I may be able to bring better access to investors, institutional investors, as well as regulators to bear. Uh, fascinating to see. So, this is why I say parallel universes are emerging. In fact, if you go back and look back into the community, there's a recognition. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Token Foundry project. They just went live with an enabling protocol called Foam. I'll come to that. But they're offering decentralized strength for consumers. I'm not sure what decentralized strength is, but. Uh, Consensus sits underneath that, if you're familiar with that, at the Ethereum, the design studio that Joe Lovin has out of Brooklyn. Uh, what they are offering is, I broke up their services into these three categories. These aren't their choices. Protect, enable, and assure. So KYC, suitability analysis, trust, treat your customer fairly, uh, enabling technologies for buying and selling tokens, proof of use, use of the token, mediated through proof of location, through foam, a crypto spatial coordinate protocol. Uh, all I can imagine is, I don't have my cell phone with me, is that I'm in Brooklyn, I traded a token that I had, 
They're using my device and decentralized nodes to triangulate and verify that that was my device associated with my ownership of that token, right? The problem is I left my phone on the subway. And someone's fiddling with it, right? So I'm a little confused about just what this, what this amounts to. Uh, consensus has an arm called consensus diligence. So they uh, will do an objective assessment, a launch assessment of a token around the quality of the code and security verifications, a network tracker, not clear quite what that is, audit reports and audits of smart contracts. Parallel universe emerging. So get off the backs of the folks in crypto, it's time to get past this too. I can tell you I walked through building after building the company I work for that did back office and middle office admin and pro securities processing for some of the largest wealth managers and money managers in the globe. And I saw rows and rows and rows of people like this, glued to their screens all day long, reconciling. A lot of their work was simply reconciliation. And this is where distributed ledger technology offers so much. So if you're coming from traditional financial <laughs> services and you're seeing what's going on, I'll share with you a framework that I've used really for the better part of four years now to sort out projects and understand them, how they fit. This is true of finance, it's true of other sectors. So if you have other interests, think about it. There's really four dimensions. Uh, from the time of transaction through clearing and settlement, what is the time, the latency, from milliseconds to days to weeks, this is all relative. The volume of transactions on the New York Stock Exchange, hundreds of millions of orders, tens of thousands of orders uh, per second, uh, up to maybe just a few hundred uh, in another asset class. Value, algorithmic trading, those trades are very small right now. No more calling the trading desk with 300,000 shares in five eighths. Now they're in decimals and they're 50 shares. 100 shares, 75 shares, meted out to the market. Uh, value, up to the hundreds of millions, if not uh, billions of dollars of notional value around derivatives instruments. How big is the derivatives market? Remember I was talking about Bitcoin being only 200, 250 billion? The notional value of derivatives on the top five banks in the United States and their balance sheets is $175 trillion right now. $175 trillion. I'm not talking about whether that's a bubble or not. It is, two, it is two times global GDP. So we got Bitcoin down here with 100, 111 billion valuation down from over 300 billion. We have 175 trillion of derivatives insurance up here in this upper right hand corner. They have to hold capital associated with that, right? They have to hold capital. So why has Wall Street been so aggressive? Efficiency and productivity gains are clearly an area of interest, that reconciliation work. Uh, but importantly, counterparty risk. If I have a derivative instruments and derivatives exposure, I have to hold capital against that based on models that I've developed. And I have to defend those with a regulator or an examiner. If I'm able to demonstrate that I can take friction out of the pricing of the two sides of the derivatives trade and exchange cash and collateral on a near real-time basis, arguably my model, my evaluation, my stress scenarios for that trade would suggest that I don't need as much capital to be held against that. That is why Wall Street has been so aggressively chasing this. That is why R3 besides the payments and the other side of this, attracted a lot of attention and interest from some of the major banks and why they've gone off and done their own thing. Because there will be some competitive advantage if they can introduce into their business, into their operations, significant advances in the use of distributed ledger technology to bring down the capital requirements, which boosts return. There's a lot of money on the table. Wall Street is the frontier, the saloon. In the saloon, everybody's looked one another in the eye and decided it's time to go our way. So if you take a look at the various uh, use cases, down in that lower left corner, our equity trades, extremely high volume, 
three years ago, four years ago, when I first started doing this, I used to say this could pose existential risk to the New York Stock Exchange, to the London Stock Exchange, to the DTCC in the United States. Well, guess what? They woke up. They're doing something. And in the upper right, as I just referred, derivatives. You can, in fact, lay almost all those other processes that I, and functions I was talking about, services, somewhere along that trajectory uh, between these two, this barbell, if you will, and posit how the introduction of the technology can take some of the friction and complexity out and start moving to lower latency times, greater clarity and transparency, reduction in counterparty risk. So yes, it is time for this two to pass, those rows and rows of folks that are simply reconciling, whether it's on a daily to get that NAV, a monthly basis, quarterly basis, tied to tax years and year end, that friction is going to come out of the business. I promised I would uh, give you some idea of the things I'm paying attention to on the side now as well, uh, watching and exploring. Uh, there is some work that's been done, not much has surfaced thus far, but I think as things mature, we're going to start asking ourselves about crypto assets broadly. I showed you a variety of asset classes there, and their correlations to traditional asset classes. To what extent will they provide d diversification as introduced into portfolios? Meaningful diversification with lower correlations, particularly under times of stress. I have a strong conviction that the folks at J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs have been busily monitoring uh, what's been going on and are already building models to evaluate, test, back test, and predict uh, the behavior and dipping their feet in. I haven't mentioned it. I've talked about VCs, but certainly ICOs, if understood as uh, a more communitarian way to raise money around a project, uh, there's an issue for crowdfunding and an interesting thing to observe there. Certainly crowdfunding could take advantage of some of the technology from an operational standpoint, onboarding processes, AML, KYC. But I'll be interested to see over time, to the extent ICOs uh, become a bit more conventional and mainstream, what impact that has on crowdfunding in different jurisdictions. Uh, credit, there's certainly margin available through some of the exchanges, but it'll be interesting to see what emerges on the credit side, the types of instruments that are available as digital assets, and how the various intermediaries uh, that are yet to emerge treat it. And then those, those last three I've already reflected on, but they really are just emergent. To, uh, what, in what way do you do due diligence? Upon whom do you rely? Is it traditional audit risk and compliance? What do we mean by that? And how do I monitor an emergent network? Most of these ventures are going to start with a minimum viable ecosystem or minimum viable consortium, and over time, if they're successful, add parties. So the network and the network behavior, the message flows and transaction volumes are going to be continuously emergent. So how do you monitor that? How do you know what is good behavior, what is malicious behavior? It isn't just a matter of cryptography. It is not. So these are the areas that I'd encourage everybody to watch and explore. Uh, we have a few minutes um, and uh, time for questions. So I can bring the lights up if there's not enough light here. Open to any, any questions anyone might have. Anyone? Yeah. You mentioned the fix API. Yeah. I mean, it might be a bit of a technical question. I'm yeah, not that technical either. But uh, I'm just wondering, you know, if you take like Ethereum, blockchain and where the APIs and the technology there is yep. so slow and fix API so fast, yep. I'm, 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 miss, I'm not going to fit in the middle. Right, so there, how do you get there? How do you, right, how so, do you so, so if you, if you, to blockchain. If you disambiguate the, the crypto asset, right, um, they're trying to, to put a layer over the top where the transactions are moving and insulate from the what I'll call the back office processing, the books and records piece of it and mediate the transactions. Fifteen years ago, I was actually with, at, out in Pasadena, and we formed a deal with one of the first firms that provided smart order routing and fixed APIs and the like. They didn't call them APIs quite the, you know, the way we call them APIs right now. Uh, but that idea of interfaces and the use of fix be becoming standardized, there were gateways that were created. So in isolation, you know, it looks like, wow, they're just creating this one thing. But if you envision something similar to what emerged over the last 15 years, where there are gateways and intermediate networks, 
that will mediate this. I think the key point is the insulation from the, the books and records layer. Um, these guys understand that and, and are working on it. That's a real good question. By the way, there's a funny story about that, how far the world's come. Uh, this location in Pasadena uh, was taking advantage of various pools, traditional exchanges as well as pools, what we now call dark pools for trading and placing equity orders. This is when algo trading was first getting started. And they had reverse engineered uh, the bid offer, all the, the various order models that existed in formats. And they had a room and the room had a group of servers. And the guy said, so imagine the trade for 15,000 shares of IBM coming through here, and it's going to go ping, 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 ping across this room. And they had labels on the servers for the different venues that were associated with it. It was, it was really a really physical manifestation. And so I was showing my early inclination toward risk management. And I said, where's your backup site? You know, I, I came up you know, just one floor to this. It's a little kind of a grungy room here. And, what happens to your clients if, uh, if you don't have strong backup? And what about that earthquake thing in California they have? So uh, that's a great question. You got me down the path there. Any other questions? Yeah, Mike. Yeah. Yes. Um, we've seen how the, the currency markets have been going over the last three years. Do you have a take on whether people like President Xi and President Trump are deliberately making an to hold down the cryptocurrencies because they seem to dive every time they seem to be going up. One of the other of them seems to be making a statement and down they go again. You might argue that, it's a good question, Mike, but you might argue that about the Standard and Poor's Index or you know, people responding to polls, uh, poll results and, and the like. I don't think that Donald Trump understands correlations. <laughs> I think he has a pretty good idea about foreign exchange and money flows, without additional comment. Um, I don't think it's, it's deliberate in that sense. On the U.S. government side, I think that the, they're letting, the United States is an agency state. It's our agencies that do things, and I don't think he could be bothered. The Chinese, on the other <coughs> hand, do have an issue and have had an issue with capital flight. Mining has uh, you know, attracted the ire and, and uh, issues for them. Uh, the Russians more welcoming. It's interesting, we do that Google Trends thing and you look at Ethereum, that's where you really start to see Eastern Europe show up. So that's a whole other set of issues uh, around that. I do think the Chinese are very conscious, but they're very conscious of, of currency and capital flows in and of itself. Um, Likewise, they understand that uh, to the extent they get their arms around this technology more broadly in the context of their surveillance state, if I can call it that, that there's elements of this that are outside of the ken of their mandate as they see it and the way that they run that country and that what they understand their mandate on behalf of the Chinese people. We can agree or disagree with that, but uh, if you ask me of the two, I would say that uh, potentially he has uh, potentially look at it from time to time. I don't think he's going on Coindesk and uh, much more than that. Anyone else with questions? Yeah. Is it right that when I will buy Bitcoin in the USA and uh, will you appreciate and I will buy with this Bitcoin a bottle of milk, I have to pay income tax. So there is a capital gain tax um, and it is not important if I sell the Bitcoin against fiat or if I sell the Bitcoin against a normal good. So is this right? Because I read this in the... In well, there's the make a distinction between income tax and capital gains tax. They, they all uh, say within... Capital gain tax. Capital gain tax. Well, it's interesting. The gentleman who succeeded me as head of blockchain at the financial services firm I worked with considered himself a Bitcoin maximalist and he actually had some Bitcoin that he used as part of his down payment on a house he purchased uh, just a year and a half ago, a substantial amount of money that his bank took. And my first question was, Rich, do you know what the tax consequences are? Are they going to treat that as a capital gain? Or is that income? Or, or He said, you know, I don't know. I don't know. And it depends on what you disclose to the IRS. So one of our greatest chief justices said, you have no responsibility to give them the maximum of what the IRS might be doing, in theory. 
Uh, said another way, if the IRS figures out comes chasing, they may start to have some rulings. No one has asked for private rulings from the IRS on this treatment, and it really is within the purview of the Treasury more broadly, and ultimately the Congress. There is this play between compliance and regulation from the agency state and the agencies that apply, how they understand their mandate and enforce the law, and the influence on policy making. And this is true not just in finance. This is going to be true across sectors. When you think about the application of this technology in areas like food and food safety, health care, transport, the environment, I believe that regulators are going to have not only greater assurance about the data they're looking at, but data and evidence that may influence how they think about the existing framework of regulations and regulatory specifics. Things they ask for that they really don't need anymore and insist on that's really paperwork. Things that they're going to require because things are different and they're moving quickly. I think this will be true across sectors. So it will be, uh, I think, a, a bit of an accordion that you'll see, particularly as regards tax regimes. Um, certainly the IRS is slow, slow to move and responsive to what the Congress will, will dictate. So something like that may make its way into the tax bill. <coughs> yep. Can I, can I add ahead, to that please? Sure. Uh, it's like as far as the UK goes, the um, latest um, in and revenue um, uh, document on this is dated the 14th of December 2014. Um, no, 12th of December 2014. And it basically says if you convert um, to anything real, you are charged with capital gain. And they don't want the rules to say so because that way they make it hard to go along. Yeah. And that's, that's the official document from HMRC. Okay, I would take a look at that. Yeah, the Bank of England came out uh, way earlier than the Federal Reserve or anyone just on uh, examining cryptocurrencies and understand there's a, there's a place for the fiat country. Mm -hmm. Just last week, somebody from the Federal Reserve at St. Louis, we have these regional boards did a, a wonderful presentation to his peer group around cryptocurrencies. He said there's a place for digital currency. There's room for crypto. There's room for us to potentially allow individual citizens to deal with the Fed, Fed wire as we call it in the States. Why? Why can a bank put money with the Fed and get 2% and an individual can't? He was openly asking this question. So I think the Fed in the United States, not the tax entity, but the Federal Reserve or Central Bank, is now looking at this and really starting to turn it over and say maybe there's something more that can be provided. It's a good question. There's another question back there? Over on the side? Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Um, thank you for your presentation. It's really great. Um, I think we live in really fascinating times and it's quite exciting to think about, you know, trying to unlock the potential to bring this to be global prosperity for all. When you're inside the room talking about blockchain and you're at these meetups, it's great and you feel the enthusiasm. But sometimes when you're out with that, there's a lot of naysayers. Mm -hmm. And you yourself, you know, quite passionate about it, you must come up against the naysayers. Is it, do you find, how do you reconcile that with your kind of business and kind of financial services? How, how do you engage with people in that to reconcile that without getting to say an argument on who's right and who's wrong because actually we don't know what this emerging technology will hold for the future and, and what it will bring for everybody. Like if you look at like Venezuela for example, it's quite interesting the, how that's developing and, and it, it's fascinating but it must be also quite scary for some of these big companies like Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan going, we better take notice of this because this is our business model and it is change Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've spent now almost five years explaining to folks who think they know what they've read, what they've heard, think they know. Most of the time it is more of a corporate audience or regulator, um, folks uh, in and out of finance and other sectors. And I have to talk them down from radical decentralization, nobody knows anything, you know, we're all going to own all our data and all the big guys are going to disappear kind of thing to, no, it's not going to be completely controlled by Wall Street. They're not going to come in and take everything over, nor are the big corporates. There will be something in between. Um, and it is the nature uh, of society right now that uh, uh, this is the history major talking here. Um, the core institutions that are the byproduct, at least in the West, of the, uh, the peace of Westphalia, after years of 
decades of religious war that led to the formation of the nation state. And then over time, uh, the financing of those states, the armies, uh, the creation of tax systems and, and uh, financial systems to allow them to, to raise, raise funds, credit, uh, as government institutions, taxes and the like. All those institutions are being challenged on so many levels, uh, not only here, back in my, my home country as well, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, that fundamental challenge those institutions are responding to. I used to, I re made reference, uh, and I very deliberately call this Reflections on the Revolution. I am deliberately referring to Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France and speeches, series of speeches he gave in Parliament and his track record over those years in the late 18th century when he was reflecting on the revolution in France, the reign of error, I like to call it. Uh, it was extreme, mm -hmm. right? And we know from subsequent revolutions, not just in Italy and then uh, in, the, in the mid part of the century, uh, but certainly the Russian, the Chinese revolutions, you know, the extremes to which uh, things can go. Uh, he contrasted that in his speeches with the American Revolution and then his view around the Raj and, and the treatment of the people of India, saying that there was something proper in the challenges that were being made uh, by those colonists in the, in the United States, some 1.2 million people actually, just found out that piece of information, there weren't many of them. Uh, and then in India as well. And I'll say this, I am a Burkean conservative and what Edmund Burke, if you distill his views, it really comes down to if we would like, to, there are things that we would like to preserve in the institutions and in civil society that we have, we must change. We must be willing to change. Otherwise, we risk all. And that's where I come down is this middle ground, this pragmatic ground, able to make the distinction, if you will, between the French Revolution and its excesses and the American Revolution in some sense. Um, so I use that, that terminology very deliberately, and I try to be a student, uh, not just of what's happening in a financial and business sense, but hopefully you've seen this in what I've presented, sort of the larger dynamics uh, around this. It's a really great question. Uh, in the end, uh, whatever comments, we, questions we may have in boardrooms, in a business setting or in a pub, it's very different, and that's why I wanted to start with that uh, Nigeria reference. What is the exact conversation that you would have with someone who's been displaced in Nigeria, who's seen a lot of bloodshed and violence, and simply trying to provide for their family, and whose definition of wealth and money is you know, very different? Why is it that there's curiosity and interest in it? What is it that we actually may be able to deliver, at least on the financial side, to support them? It's a great question. Thank you. I hope people aren't too hard on you. Sometimes. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I've come from a financial services background. Um, from my research, um, I seem to understand like people are aware of this technology as blockchain. Uh, they're doing their own research uh, with their own partners, like an asset management firm partnering with their own custodian, trying to form that blockchain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But do you think there is a kind of a skeptical mindset? to do with this traditional clients as such, like these custodians who think like the replacement of um, technologies like SWIFT mm -hmm. by blockchain would probably eliminate them from the business and because of that they kind of holding back investing in that technology? Um, if you understand these large institutions, um, they are uh, a maze of corporate, um, uh, corporate labyrinth and many different little principalities. Yeah. So any different business line executive is going to be looking at their P&L and what they're supposed to deliver and what time horizon is meaningful. And that time horizon is probably three to five years at most. If they are young and aggressive or middle-aged and aggressive, they're already thinking about that next job either in their business line or, or more broadly. Uh, the change uh, that would be contemplated in the legacy systems, and I know because I had this conversation, right? We had mainframe systems, we had distributed systems, we were developing a front and end, back, front to back wealth management capabilities, straight through processing, from client setup and trade to, uh, to reporting. Uh, the technology implications are, are significant, so you're going to get a lot of questions about that. 
I don't even think you want to have the technology conversation. You want to have the commercial conversation. What is the business model? How do we make money? And that's where you run into resistance. The other observation I have, which is more of an innovation within financial services challenge, um, and again, goes to the inertia that you're, you're referring to, um, where does the innovation coming from? If it's coming from within a business line, then it's probably more incremental to their business, right? Here's what I'm, where I stand competitively. This is what my clients are looking for. I want to add value. This is what we get paid for. Incremental innovation. A little more cozying up to startups that seem aggressive, either taking their stuff or investing in them, uh, waiting for them to die, taking the talent on. Seeing a lot of that. But within, within the corporation, what you see as well is to the extent a, 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 an independent uh, team is set up that's responsible for innovation, they're dis discarded as not really connected to the business and understanding the issues. Go let them play over here. Let them be quiet. Go over in a corner. It takes a special organization, and then there, there's one in this town that, that's able to, to get beyond that. And that's a leadership issue. That's a leadership statement uh, to, to get at it and say, no, we're going to find a way. It is a strategic imperative for our business. Now, where they choose to apply that, retail, commercial, investment banking, technology like this, seeing it as an opportunity to actually provide um, services like we're seeing from the entrepreneurs at Omniex around crypto assets, or just looking for efficiency and productivity gains, no longer having to do errors and corrections with the level of volumes that they've had to do errors and corrections. I mean, that's just a, it's a waste of money, right? You know, why is this a bad trade? Well, what happened? How can it be? Um, fat fingers usually are to blame uh, for, for bad trades. So um, it's a good question. I don't think it's exclusive to blockchain. I think it's true with the other technologies. If anything, blockchain's competing now uh, with artificial intelligence, however you want to define that, machine learning and analytics. I believe they're complementary technologies. Blockchain's foundational and supportive with those others. But anyone who's been jumping up and down declaring blockchain for the last three years now has somebody else jumping up and down on the, the, AI, the AI side. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, since US dollar is the main uh, exchange, of the main currency for any business across the globe, that is the oil exchange or any exchange, do you think uh, US would like the crypto to be a successful and of dollar going down? Uh, well, the importance of dollar goes? Yeah, the magnet, no, I don't think the US doesn't want to be uh, that, that primary, primary currency. Uh, the numbers aren't big enough. But as I said, the folks at the Federal Reserve are paying attention and they're saying to themselves, if not fiat currency, how can we enable citizens to, to have the effect that digital currencies give them with the protections that they get from having a governmental invent entity involved? The Federal Reserve in the United States, by the way, has a responsibility most directly around trying to strike the balance between inflation and employment. It'll, uh, supply, you know, the, the curve, uh, I can't even think of the name of it. God, somebody should know it. The curve that's a trade-off between employment and inflation. Um, arguably, that's broken down, but that is still the charter of the Federal Reserve. So when the chairman of the Federal Reserve testifies before Congress, they're answerable to congressmen <laughs> around what's happening in the economy at large. Yes, they have responsibility for system stability, investor protection, as well they have uh, to ensure there's competition. But we saw in the wake of the financial crisis, that when it comes down to it, system stability is what they're counting on, and the US dollar is a piece of that. So you're, you make a really good point. Everything kind of transits through, through the dollar and is a reference point for the, for the dollar. Other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, Bitcoin is a competition for the central banks because of the transparent, uh, transparent monetary supply and also fixed monetary supply? The Bitcoin core developers are doing their best to, to keep the supply at what it is. I think the emergence of stable coins in the context of the volatility we're seeing, saying there's something else out there that may provide uh, more competition and assurance in that sense. I ought to be able to have a dollar in my pocket and use that dollar 
relatively lively. But don't tell me that when I've got 10 or 50 or 100,000 dollars or pounds at stake, I'm not paying close attention to what Theresa May is doing, hoping that the pound's going to take a, take a hit. Love to move some money over here. <laughs> <laughs> right? So those, those larger forces, the foreign exchange market, by the way, is the largest market. I mean, by orders of magnitude, way, way larger. So the forces we're talking about here uh, and the impact uh, that uh, altcoins will have is, is de minimis. It's at the margin, the early adopters. To the extent you can have stable value uh, in a medium of exchange, I think those people in the developing countries will see that as something that they can depend on. And that's why I hold that bar out there. We can't just use our developed country lens on this. We need to understand the, that core appeal as well. And stability will be important in terms of value. <coughs> I'm not sure I answered your question because I don't know that there is a, an answer consistent across uh, jurisdictions. Any other questions? Yeah, in the way in the back. Yeah. So thank you for that. I've, I've got a practical question. I'm yeah. a relative newbie to the uh, industry. I'm here mostly to see if there's an investment opportunity for me for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, so over the past few years, um, Bitcoin seemed to be where <clears throat> I thought an investment could be made. I missed the board and didn't invest. Now, reading between the lines, I'm hearing that blockchain is the next big thing. And I'm trying to understand how I get into that. And, and on a practical note, how does one, which shop window should I be peeking into? or who should I be talking to uh, to get uh, to get into this, if that made any sense to you. Yeah, yeah. Let's make a distinction between Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Mm. Um, and blockchain as an enabling technology with a small b, mm. uh, and the protocols that enable it. Blockchain's not investable. <laughs> uh, companies like ours are investable <laughs> at, at some level. Uh, the ICO projects that are trading off of uh, Ethereum, uh, a certain uh, a token mechanism that Ethereum has. If you actually look at the history and the correlations among cryptocurrencies, you'll see, um, especially through that boom period and, and the sell-off, that Bitcoin has represented anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the market capitalization of what ended up being about 100 currencies. There are 1,900 as of a few weeks ago, 1,900 coins right now, 1,900. And I showed you the, the deceased and parity list there. Um, so uh, doing due diligence, finding reliable sources. Uh, folks out of the Bitcoin community would argue I've got, we've got a 10-year track record there and a core group of developers that have committed um, to maintaining the supply and, and, and managing around not just spec, there's speculation, yes, that's driving, uh, driving fluctuations, but uh, the reliability and stability of that value. That's a battle that we can continue to fight. Ethereum's got a different hunt. They want to decentralize the world. They want to eliminate management of any sort. Resource democracy, whatever that means, uh, enabled by smart contracts. So that's investable if, you, if you'd like. Um, as with any investment, you know, put my old stockbroker hat on with my licenses and everything else. Diversification. Do your research. Money that you can afford to lose. Invest over time. Break up your investments over time so that there's fluctuations you don't feel. Know and understand if it's at 6,000 and it goes to 2,000, are you ready to pile in more? Or are you panicking out when it's at 4,000? deliberation and construct. It's the same kind of advice that an investment advisor would give you. I can't endorse any, any specifically. I own no cryptocurrencies. And I understood from the very beginning, because of the role I was in, that I couldn't, that it would be compromised. And I still feel the same way. I, I, I should be able to speak um, directly without being uh, compromised one way or the other um, around that. Yes? Um, real use cases, just as a aside from adoption. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing is. Do you think 
financial services is going to produce what we might be able to see as the first tangible real use case coming out of what's been inspired by Bitcoin type tech innovations, <coughs> such as blockchain? Yeah, it's a good question. I'll, I'll argue that um, actually we have use cases in supply chain already yeah. for property rights. Um, our area is uh, the operating life of a physical asset, so we, we're around the fringes of this concept of supply chain. But the idea of multiple parties over time uh, providing uh, traceability, verifiability, and auditability of the, the provenance of a physical asset as it moves through its supply chain in some context, whether it's a commercial context and the contractual provisions around that, a regulatory context, uh, a legal context, supply chain use cases seem to have caught wind. Some people consider that to be low-hanging fruit, but there's substantial friction. That's one of the reasons you saw trade finance on my list, because related to that is the, the, the chain, if you will, that would be the, the trade finance support to those supply chain transactions. Today we saw an announcement from Walmart related to supply chain and food safety. Somewhat dubious, it's not clear what's quite out there. There's been a lot of patent carpet bombing going on. Uh, not just in finance, but in the supply chain area. So it's not really clear what it is they're asking or whether Coindesk, once again, got things a little bit wrong and a little bit hyped. Um, but I would say supply chain is the place that I would, I would look. I think I saw one other hand up. Uh, yep. I, I know you've been talking about blockchain, but I'm more to change a little bit. So yeah. regarding the topic, is there any other technology that you're looking at or has been talked about in your arena, like Hyperledger or, or anything along with Hashgraph or, or is it blockchain, blockchain? Well, again, blockchain, I'm using blockchain as a small b. Uh, a variety of enabling technologies. Uh, in finance, there's R3 Corda, which some will argue is not blockchain. Uh, it's just a database. Um, uh, when you start to look at the reference architecture there, and start to work your way up from the shared ledger, what the permissioning is, um, and then up to consensus mechanisms, um, you start to see uh, a real combat going on, I think, right now, uh, among enterprise Ethereum, interested projects, R3 Corda, and Hyperledger. Hyperledger has, most prominently, Hyperledger Fabric, which came uh, largely through the financial services community, um, donated by Digital Asset, I believe, uh, into, into the Linux Foundation's Hyperledger project. And Hyperledger Sawtooth, originally Sawtooth Lake from Intel, that explicitly designed around enabling IoT. So we're talking, I talked about uh, New York Stock Exchange and tens of thousands of transactions uh, per minute in terms of orders or per second. Imagine a 5G IoT enabled world, a smart city, if you will with all of the devices, applications, sensors, you name it, on that 5G network, and being able to mediate, authenticate the devices, if you will. I have a, a sensor-enabled asthma inhaler as one illustration. I've got this app where I'm, you know, I'm searching for where I'm going to meet my friends, uh, and everything <coughs> in between, uh, street light monitors and sensors, whatever it would be, all of those devices, applications, sensors, and the like need to be uh, enabled and monitored. What Sawtooth Lake contemplates is scale in the billions of devices and data at the edge, these edge devices. Uh, it's got to address some of the same challenges that Hyperledger Fabric is uh, in an enterprise setting. But in terms of the vision that the, the team originally had for that and what it enables, how it connects not surprisingly, to Intel's hardware offering. Um, all is with an eye to an IoT world enabled and supported by distributed ledger technology. So hopefully that's, that's helpful. Make that distinction. Yeah? Um, there's also a lot of innovation going on in terms of wallets, for example, uh, hierarchical, deterministic wallets. What do you think about this? Uh, um, the wallets where you can contain your cryptocurrencies. So the, this is the, I used to have a broker, and I'd get, open up my statement or I'd look online and they'd say, I own this, I own this, I own this, and I trusted that it was there, okay? Yeah. 
we're now in this odd world where you actually have bearer, bearer, bearer assets again, right? It's a bearer asset, the keys. They're, it's a bearer asset. Right? I, I, lose, I lose that device, I lose access to those keys, I've lost my money. Um, uh, I, I don't make it my, uh, my business to spend a lot of time focusing on that core issue. There's a lot of different hardware uh, that's been presented really over the last four or five years as solutions, not only for um, the, the encapsulation and security of uh, my cryptocurrencies and, and my assets, but attributes associated with my identity as well and my biometrics. I mean, there's a, there's a lot going on around to what extent is something like this a better protection for me um, than something that I'm looking at online and trusting. This is why the traditional <coughs> role of custodians and fiduciaries, can I rely on, can I store, can I store value with a third party, a custodian, uh, rather than have it buried in my backyard or under my mattress physically. Um, there's, a, there's an odd conflict within the, the community about what it wants to enable, what it can enable, <coughs> where there's opportunity. There will definitely be a market for people who want to have that kind of cool stuff that they can point to. I'm not that person. <laughs> I'm not that person. Any other questions? I'm mindful it's getting late. Good. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your interest. I almost forgot. This is the first t-shirt throw. <laughs> I had an opportunity to speak at Turing Fest. I thought they had a really cool logo and t-shirts, so... <laughs> no winner! Thank you very much, Susan. Hope everyone enjoyed that tonight. Uh, thanks everyone again for coming. Thanks to Judith and the guys at Deloitte for having us once again. And we've got the room, we've got the space out there until half past eight, so please stick around for a chat. And that means you've got an hour to finish all of Deloitte's wine. So <laughs> do your best. Don't forget the cold pizza as well. So thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of the night. Hope to see you all. Next one's going to be up. Thanks again. Just mentioned, every American company under the sun.